do uh, the husband instead of him protecting her. Um, so you have a, a kind of a switch of identities that moves them into um, uh, to try to kind of erase those identities. So what do they do immediately after that is they, they pick up fig leaves and they cover themselves. And so they are trying to erase in some ways their sexual differentiation. Hi everyone. Today we have a special treat because we are meeting with Maria Brandel, who is a fellow at newpolity.com, which is a Catholic think tank. Can you say yes. that? <laughs> uh, it's a Catholic think tank for post-liberal thought. Um, so it's uh, investigating uh, liberalism um, as uh, one of the ideologies that came out of the 18th century mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and seeing how through the the lens of liberalism you have a, a new new language which starts to describe reality um, you can think of thinkers like uh, Locke and Hobbes and so um, not all of these uh, uh, it's it's really proposing in many ways a new anthropology mm -hmm. and a new understanding of the human person and so post-liberal thought is uh, trying to investigate well, what would it look like if we um, investigated those those terms and returned to a, an anthropology that was more consistent with the teachings of the church um, and more descriptive of man and God and that relationship as a whole. Which is a very daring uh, thing to do because those liberal ideas is what America is built on, right? So you're mm -hmm. kind of contesting um, the very bedrock of your own society kind of is that is that true <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah that's exactly what we're doing but it's a it's a really interesting project because well one of the things that attracted me to new polity in the first place is that it's uh not a movement that's trying to turn back to the clock um mm -hmm. it's it's really post-liberal uh if if society is going to keep moving in the direction that it does what is coming next that's a big question and uh whatever uh whatever is coming down the pike it's not going to be a return to like the 12th century century but we can still look back there to help us understand what's actually happening now in a different way of looking at the world mm -hmm. and th th this is very important and this is what's most exciting about new polity i think is that you're not trying to as you say erase whatever happened after the 18th century but mm -hmm. you take it head on. So I, I learned about New Polity um, by listening to, to your series on gender, which is like the, the, the regular thing that, that you can hear in the church about gender is that, okay, so they're saying bad things and let's just, let just imagine that they didn't happen or that those things weren't ever written or something like that. Mm -hmm. While you read Judith, Judith Butler. Butler and, and those other people involved in the movement and you try to make sense out of it and see what like how how this can be fit in in the in the catholic thought right yeah yeah so that's that's the goal something that i wasn't seeing until i met up with mark barnes uh, who i'm doing the series with was a uh, catholic engagement of academic queer theory so mm -hmm. what the academics are saying, because there's a difference between that and the popular level. Right. Um, the popular level is a lot more uh, simplistic. Um, <laughs> and it's easy to poke uh, holes in it and point out the inconsistencies, and yet mm -hmm. it still has this enormous cultural force. Mm -hmm. But then when you actually uh, go back and see what the academics are talking about, you start seeing that it's undergirded by this uh, postmodern worldview. And um, another kind of element of new polity that I think is unique to what we're doing is engaging postmodern thought, uh, not just, I don't know, condemning it and again, yeah. trying to turn back the clock, but noticing that uh, postmodernity actually has fascinating and helpful insights about mm -hmm. reality that actually mm -hmm. can help us to uh, undermine just the, the modern paradigm as it is. So that's the goal with the series, the politics of gender. Mm -hmm. But while I was listening to, to, to the series, to the videos, um, 
Yeah, I noticed that sometimes you refer to the symbolism of the gender of, of, of the, the masculine and the feminine. And yeah, some of those things sounded familiar to me. And then, <laughs> I, <laughs> then I found out that, that you're also a fan of Jonathan Pajot and that you're familiar mm -hmm. with what he says about symbolism, Christian symbolism. That's why we're here today to talk about yeah. the same thing, but <laughs> from the symbolic angle. <laughs> yeah, so I, I found uh, Jonathan maybe a year and a half ago, uh, mm. and it was very exciting because uh, especially at the same time, I was looking more into uh, New Polity's work, and that was around the time when I decided that I was going to move to Steubenville and start working here. Um, and I noticed that there's a really interesting overlap and parallel between the work that Jonathan was doing and the work that New Polity was doing. And there's not a whole lot of symbolic language. It's a, the, the journal that we produce is very academic, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the ideas overlap. And I think it's for two reasons. One, um, Andrew Willard Jones, who's kind of the main thinker, I think, behind a lot of the work here is uh, a specialist in medieval history. Mm -hmm. And so that's just intrinsically so symbolic, it just puts you into a different mindset and a worldview. So I noticed that the both of them would be approaching the same topic in a similar but very different way. One is an artist and one is an academic. So that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I noticed is that uh, Jonathan is also a postmodern thinker. Right. He is also is able to engage the postmoderns. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I was seeing overlap there too. Yeah, yeah. he admits that, that he has this postmodern side to him. And um, yeah, and he also like was trained in all that because he was studying art. And well, there's plenty of that thought in there, right? Um, so I, re I really hope that in the future, there is a chance for some overlap, I mean, for some cooperation between <laughs> new polity and, and the symbolic world. Because um, I, I think that could be really fruitful. Like you would give this this academic skeleton to, <laughs> to the <laughs> that are presented. Um, yeah, the, those rejuvenating thoughts. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think they also work together too because, because new polity is um, investigating politics. And the, we, the way that we're understanding politics is that it's not relegated to just the state. This is the realm of the state, anyone who has an official title, but politics is just the workings of society and power within society. And that's something that we all participate in. It's right. something that moms and dads and children do, communities do. And so looking at different ways that we can do Christian politics seems to be very much in line with uh, I think symbolic thinking in mm -hmm. a way mm -hmm. of how do I invest meaning into my actual life and, and live these things that I know are true. It's a, a, a practical movement, I think in many ways as well. Yeah. And also like the, 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 the feminine and the masculine are such a basic symbolic patterns and, and, and notions. And mm -hmm. we can see in, in politics these days that this is the issue that actually like gets people really attentive. <laughs> Let's say it gets a lot of attention. The, the differences and the and 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 people trying to make this a single thing or or to make those differences disappear, for example. So it's all there in the politic in politics. Yeah, and that, that's the, why I thought that's why I thought that Judith Butler was really interesting and I thought she was right about uh, this and she's a author a prominent queer theorist author she wrote gender trouble mm -hmm. um, but she she explains that politics is gender and I think at first the American pushback is is to say well no no that's that's not a political thing like this is a private personal thing mm -hmm. gender and politics they don't intertwine but I think um, part of her insight is also the uh, the symbolic insight as well and it's that uh the way that we envision the world the 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 words that we use the symbols uh that we inhabit it actually they're powerful and they structure our world and the way that we operate in it so yes uh gender is political in fact because it is kind of the foundation of our society mm -hmm. exactly 
Exactly, and, and and when you were talking to Mark, it it turned yeah, you 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 raised this issue that it's not like your hair color or having an arm or not having an arm, uh, being male or female, it gets to the bottom of your being in a way. We're mm -hmm. we're all human, but but this is a very defining feature of your life and uh, and of who you are of your and of your identity, right? So it's not. It's not a secondary thing, definitely. Yeah, and I, I think it's a it's an area of theology where there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, one of those areas is theology of the body. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who I was speaking with, but someone pointed out that um, theology of the body is is really a about the language of the body. So it's talking about the symbolic language of the body. What am I speaking? Um, asking what is gender, what is male and female, why are we twofold? This is a slightly different question. So in many ways, people seem to think that John Paul's work is, is, is complete, I mm -hmm. suppose, as, as a picture. Um, and I think what he did was very impressive um, and definitely much needed, but there's still areas that I think we need to push into in theology. And at least with uh, the, the politics of gender, we're just hoping to get the, the ball rolling <laughs> down mm -hmm. in that direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how about we start from the beginning, that is Genesis. <laughs> so you wrote to me that, that you want to think about the, the, the Garden of Eden as a representation of, of the masculine and the feminine, in the sense that it is widely acknowledged that the garden was actually a mountain and that in the center of this garden which is the top of the mountain there's this tree of life right yeah How so do you see that? <laughs> what are your uh, about <laughs> um i'll kind of back up uh if you don't mind um sure. to i think the first thing that's going on in Genesis mm -hmm. um, in the creation of man and woman. So one of the things that Mark was pointing out in his dissertation that uh, I thought was really fascinating is putting Genesis in its context. So it's a, a myth story. It's a narrative, but it's speaking against other myth narratives that are out there at the same time. Um, so it's not quite an isolated story. It's trying to speak something into uh, the error um, mm -hmm. that's been circulating in the world about um, the meaning of, of the cosmos, mm -hmm. or at least um, correcting some of the elements that were out there. And uh, one of those elements is the idea that um, it is a demythologizing text. Um, it's it's, it's positing humanity as not being divine. And it's also positing humanity as not being fundamentally androgynous. Mm -hmm. um, so what's going on with that? So one of the things that you start to notice in some of the uh, early myths that were surrounding at the time is that you have a story of man starting off in some kind of godlike position, mm -hmm. or uh, he's approaching divinity, and then there's some kind of fall, and in that fall there is a split, and then you have male and female, and so the understanding of what it meant to be man and woman was. Uh, keeping you from divinity or perhaps just keeping men in particular from a divine status mm -hmm. through the female who's a, a lesser creature who is mm -hmm. the distraction who's keeping mm -hmm. man from mm -hmm. divinity like a residue of the fall <laughs> the, or the right. impact of the fall yeah and so yeah. so male and female is not uh human nature as it's meant to be but mm -hmm. it is a distortion of mm -hmm. human nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you have the Genesis text that's saying male and female, he created them. Created so them. from the beginning, this was not meant, man and woman are able to uh, reflect the divine, mm -hmm. um, but not in a, in a fallen way. It's, it's constituted together. Yeah. The fall comes after that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the first step uh, mm -hmm. that I was seeing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, another trend that I started to uh, notice was um, this idea that if what it meant to be man in the beginning was to be a single whole and united, mm -hmm. um, you start to see the symbol of the androgen emerge. This is in all of the origin story texts. Mm -hmm. um, you certainly see a return of that imagery and the popularization of the occult in like the 19th century with the mm -hmm. idea of androgynous Adam. Mm -hmm. So you have this uh, beginning androgynous nature and then it's split because of some kind of fall. Mm -hmm. And so the, the the trends that I started seeing kind of symbolically was uh, androgyny being kind of a, a bid for divinity, trying to grasp divinity for oneself. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, this uh, split nature as being the fall or with the flip side with the Genesis story, you have that it's through being men and women together that human nature is actually able to reflect the divine. Mm -hmm. So two mm -hmm. different kind of parallel narrative myths. So we can actually see from the very beginning that um, God really wanted this uh, unity in multiplicity, right? So when he creates the, the, the world, he does that by splitting things, separating them. So you have, you have heaven and earth and day and night, waters above and waters below. And it only starts existing when it's split, but it's also one at the same time. It stays one thing. <clears throat> and this is, this is what, what, what we can call the symbol, right? The, the, the connection between the two and creation of, of this oneness, of this unity between the two, which is very much against the narrative that, that, that oneness itself without this, this, this split is the proper mode of being. Because mm -hmm. it's, 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 even, it's even before the humans are made, it's right at the beginning, the first sentences are already like splitting things into separate boxes, maybe, let's say. Right, right. And then it's really interesting um, to then move from that idea to understanding man's place in the cosmos as being not only a microcosm, but the sign of the creator in creation. Man mm -hmm. plays this unique role. So we, we know that every part of creation is a revelation of God in some particular way. And then, um, as uh, Mathieu was pointing out in his book, uh, which I did read, um, and in many of Jonathan's video, you have man as uh, kind of the, the the center point, the combination of heaven and earth, spirit and matter, mind mm -hmm. and the body together. Mm -hmm. So all of this is showing his, his central place. Um, and from this central place, he's able to be a particular sign of divinity. And I think part of that is in this separation of, I, of identities into male and female. And what it seems that the Genesis text is asserting is that it's only as male and female together is uh, divine nature fully revealed. Um, it's, it's not in this androgynous one, but mm -hmm. in this split yes. Yes, but exactly. union. So... <clears throat> While I was doing this work with Mark, so doing uh, research and, and helping him out, I, I couldn't help but uh, notice um, some patterns that I was seeing because of Jonathan's work um, and this connection between um, uh, heaven and earth and space and time and man as the, the microcosm. Um, and that kind of is what moves into the mountain and the tree. So when I was reading Mathieu's book, uh, one of the things that you just start noticing immediately is that there's kind of a pattern of dualities mm -hmm. uh, throughout creation imagery and used throughout Genesis. So the idea of heaven and earth was more familiar to me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, discovering um, the idea of, of space and time being these 
dualities yeah. and then starting to notice that masculine and feminine imagery were attached along with those and so that was what i started being attentive to at first mm -hmm. so um i started noticing okay so the masculine is often associated with uh space and stability and progress uh and it seems kind of evident by their bodies the work that they do and then for the feminine, uh, the woman is associated with time and the cyclical nature. Again, that's what her body is like. It is cyclical. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think what uh, helped me to, to move to this image of masculine feminine with the, the mountain and the tree was actually noticing it for the first time in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. So what was uh, what originally happened was that I was um, I was praying with the the second to last chapter of Revelation, which is one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. The imagery is absolutely spectacular. It's just so beautiful. It makes me cry. <laughs> um, and so one of the, the things that I was noticing in this uh, description of heaven, and I think this was even before um, I had read this book or really delved into this much in Jonathan's work, um, was that uh, there was these two imageries that were used for the description of heaven. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people have a very messed up idea of what heaven is. It's like this like static perfection. Um, you, you die and then you're just kind of put into this bright light of eternity or like nothing happens. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But then what I was noticing in this description was that uh, heaven is a dynamic place. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see the, the image of the city mountain. And then at the top, you find the tree. And then specifically what Genesis starts explaining is that this, this tree produces fruit 12 times a year. And that caught my attention because what's going on, at least it seemed to me, is that um, the, the dynamic reality of what heaven is meant to be like is, is cyclical. Uh, it's meant to be dynamic. That element mm -hmm. is going to be there, but that's at the it. same time, yeah. <laughs> time, there's... yeah, that's, that's really strange to, for there to be time in heaven. So I don't know. I don't know what that means, yeah. uh, per se, but I, I was finding it interesting that, 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 imagery was being used to describe that life and then at the same time you find the the mountain city that mm -hmm. the tree is resting on so you find that stability too mm -hmm. um and so all of those things i was just paying attention to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and so i remember at the time um it was really evident that what uh the Lord was speaking to me in prayer was that I was meant to, by my own life, participate in heavenly reality by embracing like the city mountain order reigning in my life, as well as the, the cyclical nature of time mm -hmm. seasonality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these were all in the back of my mind when I started reading Matir's book and started mm -hmm. noticing that this imagery was being connected with, uh, the masculine and the feminine with stability and order and land and space mm -hmm. and then time, uh, seasonality cycles. So, so essentially, yeah. uh, what, what I thought was really interesting was the, the relationship um, between this, the symbol of time and cycles and then the symbol of the mountain uh, because you have the mountain city that's the base and the foundation mm -hmm. uh, and brings you into higher levels of ascension. And on top you have the ornament, the crown, the, crown, the tree. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the idea of woman as being the crown of creation mm -hmm. just rung a bell and a lot of things seem to fit. Mm -hmm. it, it, it really gets tricky at one point because um, those things, uh, don't seem to have like intrinsically a masculine or, femi or feminine value. They only get that in relation to one another. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I'm a man, but in relation to Christ, I'm a, I'm a bride, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the same with, with these symbols there, with um, 
tree is usually seen as, as this connection of heaven and earth, right? <clears throat> but then again, um, the feminine is what's earthly compared to, to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. so, so feminine is this, this, this matter that, that, that gives energy and gives life to, to everything that is supposed to grow there. But then again, as you say, when you have a, a complete hierarchy, it's actually crowned by the, the cycle, the, 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 the feminine. So it gets tricky with the directions here sometimes. Like we, we, could, mm -hmm. we, we cannot think that, that whatever's below is feminine and whatever's above is masculine. Because as mm -hmm. you say, the, the, the hierarchy is actually from the top is crowned by, by, this, by, the, by the rainbow or, or, or the shell or the, or, or the crown, as you say. Mm. Now the city and, 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 and the tree. So we, we can see that, that um, the tree could be seen as, as a part of nature here. So as you say, nature has its cycles and, and it's also life, right? So, so that's, that's all the feminine imagery here. <clears throat> but you can go, you can go um, like a level lower and then see the tree as, as also a connection of a masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. It's the same as we have a, a spirit and the body, which where we see the spirit as masculine and body as feminine. But then again, in the body itself, um, the skeleton could be considered masculine, and 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 the flow of of blood is feminine, right? So th th there are there are those levels of 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 uh, symbolic interpretation of each thing, actually. And, and yeah, what, what, what you can see some, most of the time is that you, you gain a, a masculine or a feminine quality in relation to another thing, just when you put things in proper order <laughs> yeah. up, above or below something. And yeah, I, I wonder how this translates to, to, to your prayer and, and, and the thoughts that you had regarding that, that tree and, and the city. Well, I, I, I liked what you were pointing out because I, I think what's attractive about symbolism is that there's not always this one-to-one -one correspondence. Like this symbol always means this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The tree means many things. Right. Um, it's not a, a permanent sign of one thing only um, because I, I think um, in many ways that the tree itself is the union of time and space. Um, so uh, even within that, you have the the masculine and, and feminine imagery within the tree. Mm -hmm. um, totally, yeah. Yeah. So as as far as uh, what it means when you start looking at uh, the relationship between uh, the tree or the crown of creation and uh, the city mountain. Um, seeing the masculine and feminine in, in that way, I think it brings to light uh, a couple things that modernity is really struggling with when it comes to the feminine and understanding the feminine. Mm -hmm. um, we're very, uh, <laughs> um, we really don't like the idea of thinking of women as being weak in mm -hmm. any way. That's the last thing that you can admit in, in any circumstance. Um, women are, are strong. Women are heroes. Um, and sometimes you see that being like pushed in, in movies or it just kind of feels like propaganda at this point. Um, that woman is uh, the superhero to the to point say, where it kind of feels like least, you're overcompensating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To say the least, it feels like a propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... So what it means to be uh, uh, a strong woman in many ways is to start acting like the mountain or start acting like the man. She yeah. has to have a kind of power that's a masculine power. Yeah. Um, she needs to be like the stable force. She needs to be physically strong. She needs to be able to compete with the men. And so you're raising up this ideal of women and women, uh, female power being this kind of masculine power in a way that like actual women can't compete with 
Right. Uh, in general, the women that I know and am friends with just are not as strong as the men that we know and are mm -hmm. friends with. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't be able to compete in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things I like about thinking of uh, femininity in relation to the tree is you start to see um, that it's in the weakness or um, delicateness mm -hmm. that you see a new power come mm -hmm. to light. Um, because the mountain may be strong and the mountain might provide a, a solid foundation and it might be powerful in a very specific way, um, but it's not capable of producing life. It's mm -hmm. in the very fact that the tree is uh, weak in a way that the mountain is not, that it's able to produce fruit. Uh, and so I found that to be um, particularly attractive and, and helpful in understanding because you don't look at a tree um, and its delicate nature in comparison to the mountain and say, well, oh, it's insufficient at being a tree. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's not, it's not powerful and therefore it's not good. Mm -hmm. So the thing about this is that you can see on, uh, on many, many levels almost like you could say, you could even say every, every level of reality, uh, um, a disdain or, or disgust with the feminine, like feminine is not mm -hmm. liked these days. Masculinity is cherished. And you can see this, you can see that in the feminist movement <laughs> or, or, or right, at least exactly. the, the, the products of it. The, the fruit of it is that yeah whatever whatever is masculine is great and uh, the feminine is generally shunned upon um but the the difficult part about this and 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 jonathan talks a lot about this is that you cannot speak about the feminine in the public because Feminine is secretive. It's a secret. It's something mm -hmm. that you don't understand. It's something that you cannot catch and, and put in this box. It's a mystery. So as soon as you start talking about it, you make it masculine. <laughs> you get rid yeah. of the, the, the secret. And maybe the reason why, why, why femininity is so hated is that we, we have to pull everything into the public now. Mm -hmm. Everything is public now because of the internet, for example, and because of, you know, us debating across the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everything is in the light. Nothing's left in the dark. And, and femininity is the thing that is left in the dark. Things that we don't understand happen there. Like when a, when a baby is growing inside of mm -hmm. you, it's in the dark, it's a secret, like you don't know what's going on. And now we have the ultrasound and we can see the baby and we can right. see what's going on there. So there's less and less place. Or <laughs> less well, I think less, there's less place, place for uh, feminine power. That mm -hmm. was one thing that I was noticing. I mean, with the, the feminist movement, um, I, I think what these women uh, in part wanted was power, a recognition of feminine power, but because the only kind of power that's uh, accepted is uh, public power, then immediately you are thrusting into the limelight, like a masculine form of, of power to the point where the power that the feminine has is, is seen as a non-power, it's non-existent. And so what needs to happen then in order for women to gain power, because we're not admitting that they have a secret power is that they mm -hmm. have to be moved into the masculine world. They have to take on uh, this masculine form of, of public power, um, the possibility of, of uh, domination through strength um, in a way that I think, uh, yeah, is not really helpful uh, in showing the ways that uh women are really able to be powerful in shaping societies and shaping households and in, in the secret places like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so hard to talk about this that I don't even think that power is the best word to be used for, for like the, the feminine quality because power already is like marked with the masculine. Right. So I don't know if we can actually even say, even talk about, you know, the feminine power. It's like the 
the feminine Unless... quality of, of you know, <laughs> giving life to everything, like to sustaining life and everything, which is, in a way, it can be called a power, but but it also like has to be would would have to be called something else actually because yeah it sounds kind of strange in a way i guess the reason why i'm i'm thinking in those terms is because of the the book that i'm writing mm -hmm. uh, the first chapter that we have is on power and the goal of that chapter is to broaden people's sense of power and uh I don't specifically talk about uh, masculine public power, but the idea that power exists uh, in people who have official titles um, and people who have the weapon that power is in the violent or in domination. Um, but if you take a more cosmic vision of power and a wider vision, mm -hmm. seeing it as the ability to affect change, mm -hmm. it doesn't always express itself in domination and pure force. Mm -hmm. It happens in relationality and in influence and in nurturing and in support. All of these are ways of affecting change. Well, actually, so we seem to only look at one yeah, part. The feminine is, is change itself, actually. When you think of the of the hierarchy and then the the cyclical time, um, the the what is changed is changed with the with the quality of the feminine. So if if we if you see power as the as the ability to change, like you cannot change anything without the feminine, which is change itself, mm -hmm. the time, the the chaos. So yeah, and the, the another problem is that <clears throat> those those words used for symbolism are really because of because of how our society developed. I think is they are really marked. So order is seen as this positive quality, while chaos is seen as a negative quality. While in symbolism they are neutral, both of them, because the excess of one or the other is death, basically, and and. And the communion of the two is life. is It gives. It's sustainable and and is is proper. The the meeting of the two, right? Right, right. Although um, something I, I have been thinking about, and I could be completely wrong, um, mm -hmm. but uh, I I wonder um, what the Genesis narrative does to. Um, I guess, shift our understanding of those classic symbols. Mm -hmm. um, so so one thing that I, I was noticing from reading Matir's book was um, the understanding of uh, chaos and order of time and space are really ancient symbols and they were around long before yeah. um, the Old Testament was written. And I wonder if there wasn't some kind of, um, if, if they have a cynical tone to them, both of them seem to be neutral things from which you could either get this positive or a negative because that's our human experience of the world. Mm -hmm. um, chaos is neutral, could get a positive, could get a negative. Mm -hmm. um, same with order, could be too much, could be too little. That mm -hmm. seems to be the fallen, broken human experience. But then in the Genesis narrative, everything that God creates is good. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that um, might end up kind of coloring uh, the biblical understanding of those notions of those symbols um, from being like a, a neutral thing from which either good or evil could spring, but from being to being a, a, a positive thing that has a specific orientation and not only a specific orientation, an orientation that's supposed to be intertwined from mm -hmm. the beginning. Uh, in a way that is fundamentally good. And it's mm -hmm. only in our position as being fallen, broken human beings that we experience it as this neutral force that's capable of evil. Okay. Okay, so then you would see that that the act of creation, you would see it as masculine or feminine. The act itself of creation? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't considered the actual act itself. Because in, in the old, old stories you have, like the default is chaos that brings about something like there's ultimate chaos at the beginning. 
and then from from this chaos spring something and when we have god at the beginning there is logos mm -hmm. seems like the opposite right if we have god who is order and creates a chaotic world i don't know <laughs> it's tricky yeah so i mean i could be totally off the the mark there but um that was just something that i i had been wondering about um and if maybe perhaps a, a cynicism about how the world could could possibly produce evil or good mm -hmm. um instead of having a specific orientation towards good itself might also color part of the reason why um symbolism surrounding the feminine tends to be negative even in uh more ancient contexts too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um woman being associated with chaos and, and 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 perhaps chaos didn't always have this uh negative undertone maybe i'm still thinking in in a modern lens of mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. it moving towards the the negative and disorder and lack of meaning more than having the possibility of of creation and life and new things right. um but to me it still it still takes that negative undertone um, mm -hmm. Or maybe that's why we look back on that kind of symbolism mm -hmm. and, and think that it's a very cynical view of women. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, well, <laughs> the truth is that whenever I think about those things, um, yeah, I, I see myself also having those connotations that are like, it's, it's really hard to get rid of them, to, to see chaos as, yeah, it, but maybe maybe the word chaos shouldn't be used and then just potential should be used instead. Um, then because potential doesn't have this 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 this, this negative connotation, let's say. Like if you could if you could imagine the the Greek mythology, like in the beginning there was just potential for things <laughs> instead of mm -hmm. chaos, right? I, I think in, in some ways it's uh kind of the a, a, a Thomistic description of what's going on. Um, chaos and potential seem to overlap a lot in, in thought and in the thought of um, Thomas, you see it used as the same way because chaos can produce anything just like potential can. Mm -hmm. um, but at least when I, when I read St. Thomas, I, I get this hint of this fundamental orientation towards the good um, and that the possibility, the possible is the, the possible for uh, an entrance into like a created order that's meant to ascend um, mm -hmm. and not break apart and not break down. Well, this is, this is where it all gets tricky because you read that where everything that God created was good, but then, you know, the... The snake was in the garden. The tree mm -hmm. of knowledge was in the garden. It was all there. So, <laughs> and when you think of the two trees, but sometimes they are they are also seen as one. Actually, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. They are in this in this opposition of one being the the orderly and the other being the chaotic. chaotic. But it's not mm -hmm. obvious which is which. <laughs> One yeah. is light, the other is dark. But, you know, um, the tree of knowledge could very well be seen, I think, but I don't know if I'm not overstepping something here as well. Um, the knowledge as, as the, the masculine quality, because the knowledge is the seed that comes from above, like the knowledge, uh, the, the idea. So may, maybe the tree of knowledge is masculine in relation to the tree of life, which could be seen as feminine in this way. <laughs> it's not that straightforward here. No, and I, I think that's what's interesting about the Genesis text. Like I, I'm, I'm convinced that there's layers upon layers of symbolism. Mm -hmm. um, because when you, when you go back and read it, you can, you can read it with a different narrative each time. Yeah. Um, 
paying attention to different elements and just strung throughout the entire biblical narrative. Mm -hmm. Like you can look back and find the Eucharist there from the very beginning, um, or you can read it through the lens of theology of the body, or you can read it um, through the lens of a revelation on the social nature of man. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think even with the, the images, there's different symbolic interpretations that layer on one another and don't have to contradict either. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one of the things that uh, Mark brought up in his dissertation that I've, I've been thinking about um, is the, when you have the, the fall in the beginning, um, you have an immediate uh, attack on the identity of male and female, on sexual differentiation. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways you can see what happened in the fall as a usurpation of the other's role um, so woman being the one to initiate and give to uh, the husband instead of him protecting her. Um, so you have a, a kind of a switch of identities that moves them into um, uh, to try to kind of erase his identities. So what did they do immediately after that is they, they pick up fig leaves and they cover themselves. And so they are trying to erase in some ways their sexual differentiation to become more uh, androgynous, to become more and more like each other. That was one of the interpretations wow. that he was doing. So the, so the gender issue is already there in the genesis. <laughs> <laughs> That's shocking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. That's something. That's something, yeah. Yeah, so Eve taking action first and then Adam being passive. Mm -hmm. in, in this relationship yeah this this all makes sense now wow and when we think of symbolism of the of the feminine and the masculine we always have to watch out to not um translate it directly into you know men and women in general in like every right. person because like we also have I like this this Jungian idea of, of having an animus and anima that mm. you, each person also has those those qualities in some kind of a mixture. But but then again, <clears throat> do not make it just you know all fluffy, wavy, and 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 un ununderstandable, non understandable, or something like that. You need that like it it still makes sense that in relation to one another, a man and a woman are kind of representations of these of these qualities right right yeah i i think it's it's difficult because we have a tendency to move things into absolutes very mm -hmm. quickly um so uh what, what's interesting about masculine and feminine symbolism is that oftentimes in cultures you'll get very similar ones but sometimes you'll get it like flipped completely mm -hmm. um yeah. you'll find uh imagery where woman is the heavens in the sky mm -hmm. and man is the earth like stability mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so i i think uh what this is doing is that it there's there's different ways that creation can reveal uh fundamental patterns mm -hmm. and we can read it in more than one true way um, the, I guess the book of creation is speaking many things. It's using many languages. Um, and so, uh, I think one trouble that we can have is, is start to notice this masculine and feminine imagery and just immediately throw it into absolutes. Like this is yeah. the only way that men can act. This is the yeah. only way that women can act and they don't overlap. This gets immediately tricky. And I mm -hmm. think this was, um, what got me interested into the topic of, uh, masculinity and femininity in the first place is because you do notice uh trends and associations that make so much sense but then uh in actual life you find overlap all the time men can do the things that women can do women can do the things that men can do and yet there's this distinct uh identity to them and it's very mysterious <laughs> trying to explain how that can be possible and and you can see that yeah, so so that's that's the biggest problem of the gender issue, is this this pendulum swinging from from one side to the other to to those extremes, right? 
-hmm. And you can see that both sides of the debate actually tend towards those extremes. Because when you think of the right, it's, it sees um, a yeah, man should be like that, women should be like that. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when you look at the left, what they try to do is like to, to, to you know, on one hand, they say that, okay, so, so, so gender is just a social construct or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then when they think of being a transgender person, like you have to get you get this this the, these these extremes as well in in the in this way of thinking that I don't feel comfortable in my body, I must be a woman then or a man, without thinking that okay so maybe maybe I just have the, these qualities which are kind of masculine or kind of feminine in their symbolic sense, but I'm still a a man and I'm still a woman. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I, everyone tends towards those extremes uh, to those to those yeah that there is no overlap and and yeah there's extreme whiteness and extreme blackness <laughs> yeah so so one of the things i was thinking about um when you start finding this uh symbolism of masculinity and femininity is to start noticing um the patterns that are uh consistent um in asking like wh what is this what exactly is this uh trying to reveal um and especially if man if uh human nature is the microcosm and the sign of 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 god uh of the creator in creation um what are these things revealing about uh, God himself? And I think that can kind of help us move in the right direction and keep us from moving into um, absolutes. And, and maybe what I just said doesn't really make any sense. So um, here's kind of more specifically what um, I'm talking about. So um, I remember when I was reading uh, Matir's book again, uh, the idea of space uh, and time seemed to me the the same philosophical problem as um uh everything being movement uh and everything being un unity so parmenides and heraclitus like you mm -hmm. see the same kind of movement to absolutes in the philosophical tradition when people are trying to understand the cosmos mm -hmm. And the easiest thing we can do as creatures, I think, is just to move to an extreme, um, to make one thing an absolute uh, mm -hmm. and put things in boxes so that they're easy to categorize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then when it comes to God himself, we find that there's this mysterious union in the two. Mm -hmm. So you get to Aquinas and he describes God as, as pure act, but he's exhausting all of his potentiality. Mm -hmm. um and so uh what i was starting to see with this uh image of space and, and time it seems like it's a like a physical manifestation or um revelation of god's being itself which is movement uh it is change but at the same time it it is the same it is the same essence there is the logos which does not change and so it's almost by being a creature participating in reality in time and space that we get to kind of be be taught this radical like extreme about the nature of god and then experience in our own lives it as a unity mm -hmm. and, and the important thing here is that those things um exist in harmony within god and mm -hmm. we have problems when, when, as you said, one thing tries to dominate the other. If you, if you think in, the, in these extremes that you presented by, by you know, everything, is, everything flows or, <laughs> or everything is a unity, right? And, and, and it's stable. Then if you see world from just this one perspective, you also get trouble in relationships between a man and a woman because mm -hmm. one is always trying if we if we see it as a power game like which dominates mm -hmm. which you get the, the, the same trouble and 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 the power game is, is what what we have 
in society, in politics, because politics is basically a, a game of power, right? Who gets the power? Mm -hmm. And when you see the, <clears throat> the political side of feminism, it's also about power. So whenever one of the one of the elements tries to overpower, there is death. You you lose life. They they can only exist in harmony. W mm -hmm. When you have this this mountain, but the rivers flow flow of out of this mountain, and 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 they give this blood, they give this life to to the mountain. So one of the ideas that I found really helpful. Um and trying to kind of check uh, this human tendency to absolutize mm -hmm. one or the other uh, is the ideas of uh, Eric Shavara. Mm -hmm. So he wrote um, The Analogia Entis, which I have with me right now, yeah. um, an awesome book. So um, he uh, was a contemporary of Edith Stein, if anyone's familiar with her and her work. Um, he was very influential for Cardinal Ratzinger. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this book is about the analogy of being. Um, it's called Metaphysics, Original Structure and Universal Rhythm. So uh, it's a really complex and very, very, very dense <laughs> book. Um, but the idea uh, that I think he's, he's getting at is this, is that um, what creaturely being is and what it means to do creaturely metaphysics is uh, not to be a thing that has like a stable permanent ground. This seems to be what um, philosophy is trying to accomplish is to find a stable permanent ground from which we can build everything. Mm -hmm. um, and you can get it in both bubble. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but you can, you can get it in both uh, directions. So um, one of the places that he begins is a, a metaphysics. He calls it a meta ontic and a meta noetic so trying to <laughs> um <laughs> approach metaphysics from uh, an ontic perspective from being itself mm -hmm. um being that's out there and that's the foundation that's kind of the the more classical turn of metaphysics that aristotle takes mm -hmm. and then you have um more of a enlightened move to go to the meta noetic and saying well i'm going to begin metaphysics in, in my mind in the noose mm -hmm and to create a, a firm foundation there. Um, and what's interesting about Shavara is that he does not say, oh, well, we need to get out of our heads and just uh, go back to, to being itself because he recognizes that there's a legitimate critique by uh, that the, the meta noetic is bringing. And that is, mm -hmm. I can only get to being itself through my own consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm already biased so to speak, when I approach the world. And so what you find is that uh, what it means to be creature and to do creaturely metaphysics is not a stable, firm ground, um, but it's a dynamic movement between poles. Mm -hmm. Because when you look into, uh, if you start from the meta-ontic presupposition, what you find within it already is the meta-noetic presupposition. Mm -hmm. And the same is true on the other side. Even if you begin in the mind and you think you can build your tall tower from there, uh, you find that you are being driven by this fundamental meta-ontic presupposition, which is like there in seed form from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Like both are inside of themselves. And so what you need is this, this rhythm. Communication, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he, he takes that and you can take that in, in our sense of uh, approaching God and understanding God um, because God uh, like has these extremes or what we would consider extremes within him, mm -hmm. uh, pure act and then like exhausted potentiality. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot approach him by a straight line, mm -hmm. so to speak. It's, it's, it's not possible for us. What we need is uh, a dynamic rhythm, a going back and forth mm -hmm. um, as we approach God. And I, I think that that kind of rhythm is helping, uh, helps us to, to understand the relation between um, masculinity and femininity um, and keeps us from absolutizing them and saying, okay, women can only do these set of things in this box. 
It doesn't overlap with the masculine at mm -hmm, all mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then vice versa, mm -hmm. but rather understanding that within the feminine, like you find the meaning of the masculine there because her body doesn't even make sense except in relation to the man and vice mm -hmm. versa. And so mm -hmm. in order to understand it, you really can't absolutize it. Like you have to have this dynamic polarity as you approach trying to understand it. Is this why people dance? I I, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I, I I think it's uh I, I think uh dancing is actually a really uh helpful sign of teaching people how men and women ought to relate to each other mm -hmm. or can relate to each other. Mm -hmm. There there is even a a concept at least in poetry, my wife is dealing with that, um, where Jesus is seen as a Lord of Dance. Not, not the Irish Lord of the Dance. But <laughs> <laughs> like, oh no, <laughs> not that one. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord of Dance. Yeah, they, they, so so this is, this is what, what symbolism most often boils down to, is the communication of the two. This is how, how the symbol is born. Where you... See, where you dream of that ladder where the angels go up and down and they bring stuff up and they bring stuff down and this this is where the, the unity in multiplicity is always the, the good the good vision of that and so so when when so it's not a what's important is is to see that um, that when symbol when the symbol is born we actually become one. It's like when, when, when a husband and a wife, they become one body. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you have two opposites which are kind of brought together, but they, are, they actually become this oneness. There is, there is a sense of oneness in them. So you you cannot so so there, there comes a moment where you cannot find this border between the the the, the white and the black. It just becomes one. <laughs> it's really it's really um, tricky and it's and it's hard to to bend your mind to this idea sometimes because we can think of of, of things coming together but still having like a border between them. So you have this this this, this masculine part and then you have this feminine part. And, and those are like, like two puzzles, but these are not two puzzles. They, they actually, we, we see the picture that is made of puzzles maybe, but the picture is the one which is, yeah, like can, can really like be hard to, to accept sometimes <laughs> in, in, in your thought. So what else can you tell me about this? this Analogia entis about the book. So um, one of the, well, I, let me just find a quote actually. Um, so one of the, the formulas that you see um, Shivara using a lot is this idea of in and beyond. Mm -hmm. So, um, when he's looking at what it means to be creature and what it means to live in as a creaturely existence, um, he uses a formula essence in and beyond existence. There's this tension that we have between uh, essence, what we are and existence. The fact that I am human, mm -hmm. I am a woman, and yet I'm also simultaneously in a process of becoming. Mm -hmm. And so okay. it's a weird tension because how does it, work for both of those to be fit for me to have an identity but also still be in becoming mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so again you start to notice the same kind of pattern what it means to exist as a human being is not to have this like st uh stable identity this mm -hmm. firm ground it's a it's a rhythm it's a pattern on um, this essence in and beyond existence as i am what I am, but also am in the process of becoming. Mm -hmm. um, another one that he talks about is the idea of 
uh, he doesn't say God in and beyond existence. He actually flips them. He says God beyond in creation. <laughs> and so he's emphasizing the, the transcendence of God mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, a same kind of uh, rhythm that happens. We find uh, God in creation, but he's also beyond it. Mm -hmm. um, he's not the same as creation. Um, he's holding in existence, but he's also imminent within it. You see those kind of absolutes show up in philosophy as, mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as making creation one with God, um, or then making God completely transcendent and not being able to penetrate into creation whatsoever. It's, it's paradoxes um, all the way down, right? It's paradox mm -hmm. upon paradox. <laughs> it's just paradoxes. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, what, what he's saying is that um, creaturely being is inherently analogical. Um, it is inherently this kind of this, this dance, this uh, tension, this rhythm, and that's all of creation. Um, to kind of move that into the connection with the symbolic realm, I think this makes sense of our experience of um, space and time or mm -hmm. heavens and the earth is that there, there's, um, it's not like a, a black and white uh, separation, um, the way that we experience it as this like intertwining, like this dance in between the two, mm -hmm. um, in a way that keeps us from absolutizing any kind of reality. Um, so one of the interesting things is on uh, page 159. Um, so he says that, um, so he's talking about the, the in and beyond kind of movement. Um, uh, he says, but neither can this tendency simply sink down in a way into a suspended back and forth as though it were ultimate. Um, and to posit a self-enclosed creatureliness is therefore to arbitrarily freeze a transition into a fixed state. Um, so again, like uh, what it means to be be creature is to be in this this movement, and we can't absolutize and, and freeze um, any part of it. The thing that is just happening in my mind right now <laughs> about this is I, I start to, to I started to think about the the separation, yeah, of the two, and then how these things. Um, how the how the things that are going on, on now with the gender stuff are actually can actually um, be of I don't know how a, a help in 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 the separation that has happened because when you when you look at the world right now it's the world of the extremes <clears throat> and what the world of the extremes is the world of of the end, kind of the, the, the world of carnival, the end of a cycle of sorts, right? So or, or everything is extreme and, and, and there is like no middle point. It's just the it's just the the rim, the rim everywhere. And so maybe we've reached this point that because it, it blew my mind what you said about about Genesis where where it like flipped started started the flip right there right mm -hmm. um of of what it means to be a man and a woman and then it from there on we're just you know across the history we're just separating and separating and separating and now we're on in these extremes and i remember growing up when i was a a teenager like an early teenager i already felt that pressure of because I don't know maybe it was imposed by someone. I don't remember that, but I felt the pressure of that, that I would that I would have to become a man one day, and it felt really unattractive at that point. Like, hmm. what? Why? Why do you mean that? I? What do you mean that I will have to do things like that and be like that and have these qualities rather than those other qualities? So even though I was, you know 
growing up in a small town in Poland where no <laughs> where we didn't have any any queer ideas yet in any way like no no one heard about these I felt that I, that I wouldn't be comfortable with being this extreme male extreme masculine mm -hmm. person right because yeah it, there, there there was something that okay I'm, I'm 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 something else I'm not that like this 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 extreme image is not something that I want to be it is there as a as a pole of sorts like you have this north and south pole maybe but but this is not how reality works that that we just go to these poles and there's like nothing left in between and that's why i i i, I can understand i think why so many um teenagers and and young people experience that um with those images of, of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man are so extreme mm -hmm. you can see that that it's actually like doesn't it doesn't um present what you are and even what you would like to be and yeah so so these these um it, it's understandable that that in the world of the extremes that these kind of um problems let's say would be common mm. yeah yeah it feels like you're you're being uh thrust into two different categories um there's not a dynamic an, an understanding of a dynamic interrelation between men and women it's uh an invitation into like the work world instead of uh into a dance yes, between exactly. the genders yeah, you were invited into separation from the very beginning rather than than communication and union mm -hmm. and i wonder how how like if if it if it if there's a way that the the queer people the people from the you know from the borders from um the people that are that with, with this and with this um identity that is not easily distinguishable like if if maybe there is a role for them to play in in restoring restoring the the communication between the masculine and the feminine like you, when you have carnival you have this this figure of a of a jester which is mm -hmm. also a monster of of a mixed identity right yeah a monster is a, again a, a um a market word <laughs> monster <laughs> is a terrible thing but but it's a creature from 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 the border right the creature mm -hmm. from... and this this jester figure is responsible for flipping the upside down world back into normality and 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 the 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 carnival so that Lent might start again and the new year might come yeah I, I i do wonder if uh yeah if if um like gender theory has a role to play mm -hmm. um and right and flipping back the carnival um and i wonder if saint thomas can actually give us an insight into that so um one of the interesting things that i uh was noticing um in, in Thomas's treatise on law, which I think actually lines up really well with symbolism, um, is this idea that you have the eternal and the natural law, but then you have human law. And there's mm -hmm. a distinction between those two things. And that you can have the same eternal law that's expressed in a multitude of ways. Um, and it's not, there. there is uh, an objective reality and truth about the world, mm -hmm. but it's not quite as limited as maybe as what we would think. So a really simple example would be uh, honor your father and mother. This mm -hmm. is a part of the eternal law, but mm -hmm. the way that cultures do that is manifold. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in America, you buy flowers for your mother on Mother's Day. It's kind of an arbitrary thing when you just kind of take it out of context um and that's not the only way that you have to honor your mother is by performing that specific act but it's the way in which our culture 
has decided to express these things. And I think mm-hmm. that symbol is kind of like that. And the, the masculine and feminine is like that. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's so tricky and mysterious is because uh, you have the man and the woman, but the way that their, their roles can manifest, the way that they are uh, their particular sign of God isn't this absolute extreme in this specific box. Um, that's uh, uh, one of the points I was reading in a book called Gender by Ivan Illich. It's really, really fascinating. One of the things that he points out is that in um, different pre-modern cultures, you have um, kind of this, this dance going on between the genders that is not at all the same, even from village to village in the same mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. Um, what it means to be man and woman is to use this tool, to be in this space, to use this language, but there isn't like a one-to-one correspondence. This is the only way that men should be mm-hmm. is the way that my village does it. This mm-hmm. is the only way that women should be. This is how my village does it. Mm-hmm. Um, so in many ways I can, I, I understand, um, yeah, the feminist movement and uh, like queer theory kind of reacting to uh, an idea that would just kind of like truncate well, um, the manifestation of the the feminine mm-hmm. uh, or the masculine to being like one specific set of ways when there's a multitude of authentic um, manifestations of that identity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it's important also, I think, to notice that um, these things are rarely symmetrical, like the, those manifestations of, 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 of the principle, like you buy flowers for your mother, but it doesn't mean that on your father on the father's day you have to buy an equivalent of flowers for your father right. but you might celebrate it in a totally different way mm. when you think of parenting um it it's also asymmetrical in the sense that you don't have to each of the parent doesn't have to spend spend um equal amount of time with the kid Mm -hmm. but they spend this time in a different way and 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 maybe you know a father just takes the child once a year to the mountains or or something like that Mm -hmm. for a week and 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 that's that's how he does his parenting i mean in in the sense of spending the time with the the child Mm -hmm while mother is there every day making dinner or something like that like i'm I'm, I'm using stereotypes right right now yeah but um the sense is that these things are not necessarily symmetrical always or it's actually rather the opposite like these things are so different that that sometimes it's hard to compare them and that's where, where it can get where we can get problems like motherhood mm-hmm. cannot be easily compared to fatherhood. Femininity cannot be easily compared to masculinity, maybe, because those things tend to be so much different in the sense that, in, in the sense of asymmetry. And that's why um, mm. it's not easily uh, divisible into you know the one part and the other part one box and the other box because we don't have this symmetry and it's only in the in the dance where you cannot see like oh so it's 60 percent masculine and and 40 percent feminine in the dance it all gets mingled you have this movement that is right that becomes like this unity that you do where you're where you cannot divide like 70 30 90 10 etc right and then in a in a culture that has has moved and put emphasis I, more and more on male values or like male forms of of power as being mm-hmm. kind of the real, mm-hmm. and the feminine gets kind of pushed back into the background. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can see if if someone is is entering into that space and wants to like evaluate themselves and want to do that comparing. Now you're in a world where it's. You, you can you have even less language to do that because yeah. this this public understanding of of yeah. power is the one that is surreal and the other one is just non-existent mm-hmm. 
and the low when you have the the social hierarchy let's say however it sounds the the on on the lower level level you get the more feminine is visible in that mm -hmm. so when you have a family when you have a neighborhood when you have a community like here in gaming it's this community is basically um consists of women and their families it's not like a man created this community over here right it's the it's the wives it's the mothers and we are just there in the in the background the, the husbands are in the background actually and the higher up you get and uh, the more public you get like up to the let's say the president or something like that mm -hmm. the more masculine is visible and when you don't have the, 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 those intermediate levels, like family, neighborhood, community, you lose the feminine aspect again. Like the feminine is erased. You just have the individuals and then the top authoritarian power so that there is no place left for the feminine or, or all those you know, smaller smaller levels right and then and in many ways and i i know <laughs> maybe the power isn't the right the uh right word for it but like the the feminine power is kind of usurped in a way that, that's um, right yes exactly yeah as soon as you take out kind of all those intermediary structures mm -hmm. and there's just the absolute top yeah. and and the bottom uh yeah the hierarchy just it isn't there you don't yes. have that interplay and that mm -hmm. dance um just kind of to toss in new polity ideas um that's that's one of the one of the critiques um one of the angles that's highlighted a lot in the the conversation and work here is that in order to move back to a more authentic community, we need to reestablish those intermediary structures uh, to fill in that space between like the bottom and mm -hmm. the state, the exactly. bottom and the top. Yeah. Yeah. Cause this is, this is the, when, when you have the top invading all the lower levels, it's the, it's the masculine, like usurping, as you said, usurping the, the, the power of all the lower levels. And, um, it's also in, in, in economy, right? You, you, you deal a lot with, with economics in, in new polity. And it's the same thing. Mm. On, on a few levels, you, we have this, this Catholic principle of subsidiary. Right. Is that, mm -hmm. that the word? Mm -hmm. that, that, that problems should be dealt with on the lowest possible level. And, that's, and this is the wisdom of, the, of this of this idea of this principle so that those levels exist and mm -hmm. not not that everything should be sent to the top to, to the government and again right. when, and it, yeah and it's in that same structure too that you can have creativity really mm -hmm. flourish um you don't have this this top structure that's telling how it should be done on the most low levels when you have those intermediary structures yeah. um you can have smaller and smaller communities that can actually uh develop like a known particular like style or mm -hmm. manifestation or i mean you can think of it of just running households i i know um it's it's fun to think of, of households as being their own worlds like you walk into someone else's house and there's a, a new way of life. There's new basic rules, basic structures, even like the way that the world appears to a child in that household is going to look different. It's going to smell different. It's a, it's a, it's a new way of being. Um, and it needs to have its, its own, own space in order to actually be creative in that way. Right. Um, that's kind of going back in many ways to the, the treatise on law. Like you have the eternal law, um, you have uh, these eternal principles, but then these principles can be manifested in a number of creative ways. Yeah, that, that's exactly the, the, the structure of the hierarchy. You have this first principle, but then it goes down to those things that kind of reflect that principle less and less in a way, but they are all connected in the same hierarchy. And, there, and then there is this whole ocean of things that are not connected to the hierarchy. <laughs> so, <laughs> which, which don't reflect that principle at all. 
now but but when you have this multiplicity um, of of ideas and of creativity as like how how one's life should be led it's harder to control those people so that's not what the government wants right right <laughs> <laughs> Now, I had this idea that I wanted to tell you that you're also a monster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, because um, um, the USA, one thing is that it's built on on uh, those liberal ideas that you mentioned in the beginning mm -hmm. but it's also built on protestantism Pro protestantism which i'd say i might be wrong here and i might be un un uh, um, unfair but i think that that protest it, it, it was responsible for a lot of the erasure of the feminine and and like putting feminine into the background and you're an american but an a catholic at the same time where we have you know <laughs> devotion to mary that is so strong that um sometimes people say that it overpowers the right. devotion <laughs> to jesus himself and so you you have this double identity in a way right it's all in you like you you are American and you have that, but you're also Catholic and you have this other thing, which is like Catholicism in a way, when you think of the beginning of the country and the, and the, and the, the, the building pr principle of the country is not American. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's interesting being in a, an American uh, and Catholic, because you do start to notice that um, uh, Protestant theology starts to affect the Catholic mindset mm -hmm. in many ways. So um, I don't know if everyone would follow exactly what you're saying, but I, I, I see it too. Um, this uh, kind of erasure of the feminism, uh, mm -hmm. feminine within uh, Protestantism in the sense that uh, the symbolic world really gets washed away yeah. um, as we move away from even imagery within uh, churches um, and a more cosmic uh, understanding of the relationship between the church, the God and the world and it, uh, the people. Um, what uh, man and woman is, uh, is more and more relegated to the, the realm of the body um, and just reproduction, it's less of a sign. Um, you see more of that language just not being present. Mm -hmm. um, and while it's preserved in, in Catholicism, because it's not there, uh, what woman is more and more is, is uh, the one who has the children and the one who runs the household. And so her meaning comes more from her body because they're missing that more symbolic element. What is she revealing about divine? What is she uh, revealing yeah. in connection with cosmos? Yeah, so, so, so you are reduced to your body while the masculine is, is upheld to just the spirit, I guess, then. And there is this, this disconnect between the two, right? And so, so why I said that you're a monster. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> you have to explain that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so having that kind of mixed identity um, lets you understand what's going on and lets you see the things that are invisible, for example, for, for a person um, from a Catholic, just a Catholic country. And so when, when, when Protestants come to Poland to evangelize, um, they, it's, so, it's so easy for them to, to get following because for, for a Polish person, like, okay, being Christian is, is Catholic, of course, right? Like it's right. Not, 
there is no division between, and there is no understanding between what what it means to be Catholic and what it means to be Christian. Like, if, mm -hmm. if there's even a difference in there, so that so that we never study, for example, uh, the differences between Catholicism and Protestantism. We have no idea like what, <laughs> what, what the differences are. And when someone wow. <laughs> comes here and, 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 and tells us these things about God, Jesus, etc., etc., like, okay, sure, sure, I know. I've read that. <laughs> I've read that in the Bible or I, <laughs> I heard that in the church. Yeah, so there's, there's Jesus, there's God. Sure, sure, yeah, he came and he saved us. And like there is no protection against that in a way. While you with, with these with this double kind of double identity or this mixed identity, you have you can communicate between the two worlds and that and that way you understand both of them. And yeah, so 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 you can be and, and that's why I love I love listening to to Catholic apologists from America because they know so much about what Catholicism is. Thanks to that that they have to face the other right. On, on the regular basis and that and i wonder how this can translate to the queer again <laughs> if, if 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 the queer can be the ones that that will actually be able to see the the two worlds and see mm -hmm. how they are on the one hand connected but also how they are not the same yeah, so um, I was reading in, in Augustine, he has uh, a lot of uh, sections on monsters kind of scattered throughout the city of God, mm -hmm. just small little pieces every once in a while. Um, and so at one point, he starts uh, listing kind of um, like uh, human anomalies or monsters, people who some some people who are uh disfigured or just different um sometimes they're like um hybrid creatures like half uh, wolf half man kind of lumps them all into the same category and he throws up his hands he's like oh I, probably some of them are real probably some of them are not i i don't know because i haven't seen all of them but what is this what is the point um and so he points out that um monster is connected to the the latin word monstrar to show mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so what the monster can do is is kind of show us something again and mm -hmm. anew it calls our attention in a new way um and so if you if you take that idea and uh look at what um queer theory is is doing i think it it can uh show us the errors of what we were doing which was kind of absolutizing uh, masculinity and femininity into um, like these kind of boxed realms. Because mm -hmm. um, we, we do see modernity move in that direction. And that's, that's a conversation that Mark and I have had uh, a little bit um, is that there, there is a kind of a needful rebellion <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in many ways. Um, to go back to the 1950s, uh, ideal. Um, maybe it's not quite the ideal that we we thought it was. Um, one of the things that uh, Ivan Illich points out in his book, uh, he has a lot of critiques against um, the, the the 50s as kind of a, a product of modernity is because the dance between the genders is lost. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we move into what he describes as more of a kind of a sexless society mm -hmm. and um the understanding of gender is less kind of like round and dynamic mm -hmm. um and in that kind of world he's pointing out that women tend to suffer more mm -hmm. um and they just become like kind of uh stuck in their nice suburban house just uh buying commodities that the market tells them that they need to have um, and providing for their families in, in that way, instead of being kind of like household runners and being creative and having this dance with the different masculine and feminine roles and um, like taking care of the farm and the animals and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I, I do think that maybe um, we can be attentive to uh, what the monster is showing us. 
Mm -hmm. um, this like kind of like hybrid identity, this edge place, um, because it can reveal to us the places that we tend to absolutize mm -hmm. uh, masculine or feminine roles. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, so when we are swinging between, between those two extremes of, of masculine and feminine being completely separate and there is no distinction between the two. When you get the, this monster figure, it can show you that um, those categories, those categories do exist. And they, on, on the most simple, on the simplest level, you can see that in sports these days, and this is actually happening there. So, oh right, right. We tried pretending that. So that that's the basic phys physical level, and and I really hope that we can get into deeper levels with that, <laughs> not just the physical one. Um, when you had the, these this these queer figures. Um, taking part in, in these sports, like they attract a lot of attention. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And the other is that there is rebellion, um, especially from the feminine side. Yeah. But, okay. So, so this, this cannot be like that. Like we can, we cannot have, we cannot pretend that, that, that there is no division between the sexes at all. Right. Yeah. As as soon as uh, the, the the transgender woman starts excelling in all the the sports, and then like actual feminine competition is is kind of wiped out. Um, right. yeah, yeah, you can see the like the this like hybrid identity, like actually like revealing identity in a new way, mm -hmm. uh, in a very unexpected way. Kind of going back to the jester figure that you were talking about, like paying yeah. attention to that and watching that figure kind of flip things back around. Yeah, yeah. So it's like women waving now. Hey, there, there is femininity. <laughs> the women are still here in the world, right? You, right. you didn't re erase us yet and you cannot erase us. And it's actually like, because lately there was this, this swimming competition, right? I, I'm sure you heard yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. But then there is this um, cycling tournament that is coming. And yeah, there's, there's a trans woman had wanted to take part in it and like that was not allowed by the people on the like on the outrage from the swimming competition i think the, yeah, they, they they adjusted the rules again so but that's that's just you know the basic the basic physical level where one of the yeah one of the things i was thinking while you were uh talking is um something that Jonathan says is that you, you have to kind of watch the stories play themselves out. You mm -hmm. have to watch the patterns go and unfold. And so um, what's interesting is that you are getting a, a movement from the theoretical sphere into the sphere of actual manifestation into actualizing those things. And so you have kind of the, the feminist um, uh, push that men and women are exactly the same and can do exactly the same things. And as the theory is driven into actual practices, we actually um, manifest the hybrid identity. Um, that's what actually, um, you have to have the whole pattern play itself out and then it can turn, it can flip. Mm -hmm. So the, <clears throat> the hope that we need right now is that um, this doesn't bring us into even a further extreme again so that okay so let's like get rid of all the the the, the, the gender issue stuff and, and let's go back into the extremes of mm -hmm. the masculine and the feminine never meet right right <laughs> and so that, I, that, that's always a, a, a threat there right i i think that's uh, one of the important things that mark and i are trying to keep in mind is we're engaging with uh, queer theory or just kind of the movement of new polity as a, as a whole in order to not um, just idolize the past and try to turn back the clock and to get there is to return to that with a critical eye um, and actually gauge postmodern thought head on um, and try to see what, what true thing is it telling about the world? Because um, I mean, gender 
ideology is very compelling and things don't compel people if they're based on complete falsehood. There's mm-hmm. some kind of kernel of truth that's mm-hmm. there. And I think, I think that should be the Catholic mode of engaging things because we can't, like Jonathan says, we can't just, we can't stop the pattern from unfolding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to ha- let it, the story, the narrative just play out. Mm-hmm. Um, but when there, there is the end, when there is the, the flip, we don't want to be left in that place uh, in chaos and not understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's uh, in some ways the role of, of Catholics is to kind of prepare um, for that eventual flip um, and to engage the thought head on and to try to comprehend it uh, and actually go into it and find the kernels of truth that are there Mm -hmm. and bring those back into the fold uh, instead of just saying, you know what, everything about this is false and we just need to go back and and grab this former ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Because we we were there already and it didn't work out. Right. Mm -hmm. There is no going back (laughs) to things that didn't work out. I, I just remembered um, another example. Um, so there is no shortage of, of tweets and, and images from Ukraine right now, where you see that the guys that were um, like drag queens, cross dressers, etc. Now, like there's a the, the, there's a photo from before, and now they they're all wearing uniforms and, and fighting in the war. So there's also like this. As as hard as it is, as it is to say that the war the war is a way of, of flipping the world. Um, like yeah, the, I, I the, think yeah. I think you're right because when I I think that's kind of the same pattern as like the the movement from the theoretical into the actualized. Mm-hmm. Um, when yeah. you can kind of perform these activities in a way that um, doesn't really have like social consequences. If your private life in general doesn't have uh, immediate social consequences, then those things can exist. But mm-hmm. then when you're actually being pushed into like a dire situation and you need Reality. to like actualize, mm-hmm. you can't hold on to the fantasy anymore. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Like you, the reality hits you. <laughs> it, it's just a pity that it has to hit you with such a force and brutality. <laughs> so, um, there is there is one uh, jo- there is one video by Jonathan about um, is Christianity a cuckold religion? Um, I, mean, I have seen this, but you'll have to remind me what's about. <laughs> yeah, so so it's a really so I think this thing kind of connects to to the transgender and and the queer and the and insults and Unix. Um, but yeah, it's really it's really it's a really tricky topic that is really hard to talk about because. Uh, I, when I was talking uh, to to Dr. McNamara about mm-hmm. um, Mary and Joseph having both vocations inside of them uh, at the same time, so Mary being a mother and like a nun in a way, yeah, right? and Joseph the same thing, like being a father to Jesus, but but also like an incel, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> a eunuch. <laughs> and yeah, so, so, and that's, that's a, that's a tricky thing that is always present in, in Christianity that um, we reveal the truth about sexuality. The truth of, of sexuality is revealed by also by those who abstain from it right so the celibate lifestyle this uh kind of reminds me of 
uh, one we were talking about earlier with Protestantism, Mm -hmm. um, there really isn't a a role for the celibate. Um, The monks and the nuns do not exist. And so I think that and the loss of the symbolic worldview is why the meaning of man and woman is reduced more to the body and to roles. But then when you look into uh, the Catholic uh, vision of the celibate, (laughs) you have uh, someone who is actually manifesting their sexuality, that is living their identity, um, but not in the married state. And so that's another thing that we have to to grapple with. And so um, some of the, the movement that Mark and I were going towards is that, well, like this this shows that what us what it really means to be man and woman like transcends procreation Mm -hmm. um and i think this really does fit well with the symbolic worldview and why i kept turning to it in my my thought because if um the the purpose of creation is to give glory to god and to reveal who god is uh and his his nature and to bring humanity into relationship with God, um, then we can see how masculinity and femininity are able still uh, to manifest those in kind of an, an extreme symbolism. So you have the nun as being the ultimate symbol of the destination of humanity, which is the bride of Christ. And right. in no way does that take away from her femininity or mm-hmm. her feminine role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it also kind of helps. However, some women may find it hard that the roles in the church are also different, right? For, for, I mean, their religious life, Mm -hmm. uh, church roles are different. The, the, the question of why can't women be priests? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think that question is it's kind of a, a, a misguided question. Again, it's, I think, approaching things from this idea of um, absolutizing the, the, like the masculine or, or the public or power in that kind of hierarchical fashion mm-hmm. and not seeing what uh, feminine power is or what the feminine sign is. Um, something that you were saying earlier, I, I was thinking of it, and this is a perfect time to bring it up is the the connection between um the the feminine and what it reveals about holiness Mm -hmm. um because what's interesting about the feminine and the holy is that both of them are veiled both of Mm -hmm. them are sacred both of them are secret and i think what's unique about uh the symbol of the nun in particular and her spousal relationship with God is that uh, she reveals that the height of humanity is in the hidden Mm -hmm. Um, and that approaching God, approaching divinity doesn't uh, happen primarily in an external hierarchical, powerful way, like building the tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's in the secret places. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. in the heart. It's in, it's in the dark that's how one approaches God. That's that's where holiness dwells. Which which is uh, the you see that that that's, that that could be seen as the feminine part of Protestantism, um, where like your relationship with God is done, like the the, the mm, it, there's more pressure on 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 the the thing that is going on in your heart than the um, structure in, in the outside right so we, to, to give to give the proper credit to, <laughs> to protestantism and what we can learn from it and what i think we have as as the catholic church learned or or we are learning that from from protestants is that this this individual uh relationship to god relationship with jesus like that that wasn't necessarily present before that when it was just a as being in the hierarchy <laughs> yeah or i think that what protestant protestantism can do is is re- reveal to us uh the genius of the structure that's already there so maybe going back to the image of the mountain and the tree is mm-hmm. is helpful 
mm-hmm. um, like the, the, the hierarchical structure is moving you towards something like it's, it's important for us to go through the externals through communal acts together in the liturgy. Um, this is the way that we kind of ascend up the mountain. Um, but the goal obviously is not the externals. It's not the, the hierarchy. Um, still the, the crown is, Mm -hmm. is the tree. The goal is the hidden. The goal is the vulnerable and the life giving. Um, so I think even that image is really helpful. Um, and so, yeah, we can, it's, because we have this this tendency to absolutes, when you look back in church history, you do find that kind of swinging, um, the emphasis, overemphasis on the externals, and then maybe the overemphasis on devotions mm-hmm. or the private things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and that's just a part of the historical kind of dance <laughs> yeah, yeah, as yeah. the church tries to mm-hmm. approach God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like what you say about... Um the holiness and the feminine because when that that's the way we represent the saints right with a halo Mm -hmm. a circular shape (laughs) over their heads oh i never even thought about that oh that's fascinating so so the 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 crowning of the of of the hierarchy right so that's the that's the circular thing on the top it's the rainbow it's the sometimes it's the shell Mm -hmm. just a i did you go to poland I did. So in Częstochowa on the altar, you have the figures of, of saints and, and behind they have shells, which function as, as halos for them. So this is all, all feminine, <laughs> all feminine <laughs> symbolism. So, yeah. And then you find that too in the church mystics as well. And maybe that's why, um, I, I, maybe you're talking about from experience in in Poland, if there is more emphasis on the the external, and in a in a world where we just move towards the externals, um, and less value is placed on the hidden, there is the hidden treasure of the church, which is the church mystics Absolutely. and her spiritual writings, which yeah. a lot of people I know haven't encountered them. But when you read them, the the soul is always feminine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, she is the the bride of of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so 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 one way of looking at uh, what's unique about the feminism feminine is that she can actually reveal to us uh, how we are to approach God, uh, what it means to be the bride of Christ. Um, yeah, and this this connection between uh, like approaching the the highest things through the mode of the hidden and the mode of the vulnerable. And yeah, it's like all the time we, we need to um, be aware to not fall into either of the extremes, right? Because you cannot also build the church on mystics alone, or you cannot build your faith right. on mystics alone, but you cannot, you cannot do it either without them. So they are the necessary ingredient. They are the spice of our spiritual life. <laughs> <laughs> and, but yeah so so it's necessary in indispensable and at the same time you cannot eat only salt right <laughs> right yeah um, i i to to move back to um what shivara was saying that the general pattern that he was seeing just the structure of the universe and then like moving into the structure of uh the the spiritual life um, it's not even so simple as like one leads to the other, like the, the externals lead you into the intimate, um, the intimate also leads you back out into the externals, which lead you back into the intimate. So it's not just a flat movement from one to the other. Yep. Again, it's this, this dance, this yeah. rhythm. One, one informs the other, right? Yeah, because I, I still have some hunger for, for, for you know, the, the transgender and the gender issue. I'm going to talk with, with McNamara again about um, transgender from the, from the TOB perspective. But TOB is TOB, right? That's theology. But I was, mm-hmm. I'm still wondering about this um, symbolic thing, how to understand 
transgenderism from the symbolic perspective. And I, like, <laughs> I still feel that there's something missing here. Is this just confusion or is this some kind of a pattern that, that is going to reveal something to us? Hmm. Um, I, I think maybe one, one insight um, is that in, in some ways, maybe you have a, a, a movement toward uh, mixed identities um, or also a movement back towards androgyny again. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to bring back that symbol. Um, so I suppose you could see, say that it's a kind of a biblical pattern. Um, so from the beginning after the, the fall, you have the blurring of identity kind of right in the beginning or the hiding of identity and the blaming the one of one another. Um, and so I think one insight to help us understand the pattern uh, is to start to see that it's, it's kind of a, a movement back to grasping the divine again. Like this is all the same human movement of trying to be self-sufficient in myself um, and wanting to maybe traverse all categories to bring all categories or identities into myself, or at least in the way that I so please. Um, is and there anything positive about it? Or is this just bad? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think it's certainly, well, I guess this is a positive that's a negative. Uh, like we're, we're experiencing in a kind of a more actualized way, the limits of creaturely existence um, mm -hmm. that we can't accomplish self-sufficiency or divinity or this ideal of androgyny, um, which I think from the beginning was meant to be uh, a gift. Um, and so you can see that pattern kind of play out in two different directions. It can either move into uh, a direction of uh, gratitude for the limits of creaturely existence, mm -hmm. of realizing that we are uh, dependent and that I can't manifest all things uh, at all times. Um, and this is a, a, a good thing and it puts me in relationship with my creator or a complete rebelling against that that just ends in cynicism, which is kind of where Judith Butler ends up going. So that's our end game cynicism about our existence. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we all experience that to some extent, don't we? <laughs> all right. So let's see how it unfolds and what happens to the world in the following <laughs> months and years, if we have years left ahead of us, hopefully. Right. And, and if there's a chance to any return to any kind of normality. <laughs> thank you, Maria. This yeah, thank you very much, Kuba. Great time. Great, like you're you're really brilliant. So I really enjoyed spending this these, I don't know, two hours with you. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a great conversation. I I don't get to talk about symbolism as often as what I'd like. And I really hope or uh, the, that new polity will like, succeed in all of your endeavors and yeah that first the that that first Cuban will will be changed and then it will spill over to other towns cities and countries hopefully yeah and that you also find a proper place for you in all that <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah it's it's really exciting to see what 
is happening in Steubenville. And uh, I think that what's going on here can definitely repeat itself other places. That would be great. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks Bye. so much. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you.